Would you talk a little about you? You, you mentioned that this is the yard site of your daughter's yeah uh, uh, yeah untimely death. Yeah, uh, the word yard site. I, I'd like to change it Yom Hashana. Yard site is Yiddish. I like to use Hebrew. I don't like to use Yiddish so much. It's the, uh, just a few days ago. That was the date. When my daughter Talia and my son-in-law Binyamin, Shemyakam Damam, they were murdered. Murdered by a terrorist attack. That was 12 or 13 years ago. It was a very difficult event in our lives. I use a very wishy-washy word. Difficult event. I don't, I don't think anyone can understand what happens when your daughter is killed and your son-in-law and you have six orphans. <laughs> six grandchildren that are often at that moment they had six children yeah five girls and one and one boy the boy is now 19 so he was only six and uh, the youngest girl she was only two months old when her mother was killed she doesn't remember her mother then Shalom Tzion she's the youngest of the six she was um, only two months old who raised the kids who raised the children your grandchildren? Ah. Well, the whole family moved to Tapua. My wife came from the north, my family in the north, and we're all together with the orphans. We have uh, one of my daughters is in a neighboring community, Itamar, which is close by. She comes once a week. But um, they have happiness in their lives. It's a strange thing to say. But they live with so much attention, with so many uh, their uh, cousins near them, and their aunts and uncles, and I'm a grandfather and my, my, my wife, my wife is very special in her role. They're very attracted to my wife and they're strengthened. And the word in Hebrew, to adopt, means to strengthen. Adoption is not a legal thing. It, you, you have to strengthen the child so he can stand up in life and not feel that he's lacking. He knows he's lacking. but. As much as possible to, feel, to let him feel that he has people around him, their families around him. The family must be the first circle around him. You can have a lot of other people helping, but it's never like the family. And did the kids grow up all together, or were they divided yeah. among the? There was a legal battle in the, in the beginning. I'd rather not even talk about that. There was a little legal bat battle about certain sides, but it was a very uh, difficult few months after the murder, but one of my daughters and my son-in-law, they had, um, they have uh, taken care of the children up till now, so. And is, is the family something of, uh, of an icon within the, the area? Yeah, you can call it that. Uh, I'd like to use a different word, icon. I mean, Everyone knows in the uh, village that uh, it's the Kahana family, but... Um, what did you think when, you're, uh, when your daughter, uh, I guess you knew Binyamin before they got married? Yes, of course. I knew Rav Kahana. I had the uh, merit to meet Rav Kahana before they were married. Very special, very great rabbi in my eyes, very, very great. Did you move he, there to that community because he was there? Hmm? Did you move there because... Uh, the well, my oldest son moved there. And he asked me to come with the flock. To bring the flock from the Galilee to Tapua, which I did. I brought 200 goats by foot. Which was a 10-day walk with the animals. Very, very difficult. But very, very uh, stimulating. A wonderful way to get places by walking by foot. Not with a, a knapsack, but with, uh, with 200 goats. I had help on the way. But it was very, very interesting. Going over the mountains, not on the road. I used to look at the people in the cars and you have to have pity on them. They didn't know what the, the world was all about. They were whizzing by and I was walking by. <laughs> it's a wonderful experience. And what was it like to, uh, to, to have your daughter marry into the Kahana family? What was it like for you? Binyamin was a very special person. I was very, very close to them. I have actually lived in their home before they were murdered. I mean, they, he was such a modest person. Very modest and quiet and very, very, very wise. <sighs> yeah, I was out with the flock when I got the news. My son called me, told me about the terror attack. First he told me that Binyamin was shot at. And then a few minutes later, my daughter was shot at. 
So weren't they together in the car? They were together. Yeah, it happened with the space of a, maybe a minute or two that they were both killed. Yeah, but it was miraculous that the children were in the car, except for the boy. He was dropped off before, and none of them. I mean, the the, the car was riddled with bullet holes. So it was miraculous that none of the children were uh, hurt at all. How many children? Uh, they were hurt, but not uh, with bullets. How many children were in the car? The five girls. Five girls. And none of them got. And the two parents were sitting in the front. Who do you think? Uh, do you think it was a random act? Random. A random act. In other words, if they said, here are Israelis, we're going to kill them, or do you think they knew who was in the car? Ah, that's a very good question. A very good question. I tell myself they knew. But um, I do think they knew. Because uh, every month or so, Benjamin and Tali would go to Yerushalayim, to Benjamin's mother, spend the Shabbat, and come back. So they knew the car. So they could identify the car. They knew when it was leaving Yerushalayim. So I think it was planned. It was just a random attack. Do you think there was any coordination with uh, the Israeli government or police? Do no, I don't any? think so. I don't think so. I, I cannot think that. I don't let myself think that. It's too cruel a, th a thought. I can't believe it. What was the relationship like between the authorities and Binyamin? And it was the... very difficult. They really um, were running after him. They he had a place where he taught in Yerushalayim. They closed up that place, they go, went through the, into, into his apartment and took all his um, information. And they, he was, he was um, run after. He, he suffered a great deal. He, was he oppressed, would you say, by the... He by was the, oppressed, of course. He was oppressed, right. yeah. Was it a, a, a Kadima? Or was it a, a, a labor government at the time? Do you recall? I don't remember. It really doesn't make any... I think every government would have been after him. Even... Uh, present government, even a right-wing government would have been after him. doesn't make any difference to me, though. All the, politics is a very dirty word to me. I don't think anyone can get into politics and remain clean. Rav Kahana, perhaps, remained clean. That's why he was outlawed, because they were afraid of him. He, if he would have remained in, in, in office another term, he would have gotten so many more votes, they knew it. So he was outlawed as a terror organization. But, was it because of terrorism? Did they come? That's they use that that as a reason for outlawing his uh, party. I'm not so um, knowledgeable of these things because I'm I'm in a different world entirely. But uh, uh, Rav Kahana was a brilliant person. Brilliant. He wrote books, things today that people should read today. That are uh, about Judaism. About Judaism. About what happened in um, what's happening in America today. It's very applicable to the to the present situation in America. The comf he has a book. It's called Uncomfortable Questions for Comfortable Jews. It's a brilliant book. It's a brilliant book. But uh, he was before his time, I think. He said things that were. He felt an urgency, and it was just before his time because. He didn't really move them out. They're still here. Who? They're still here. Who? It's too comfortable. Oh, I'm standing here in Cali I'm standing here in California. I'm almost ashamed to say the air is good here. I'm almost ashamed to say because I was um, like in the dampness of Florida last last Shabbat, very damp, and uh, the air is dry here. So I'm very. Um, sensitive to the air. I'm outside all day in Israel. But um, I saw mezuzot on the stores here in uh, Robinson Avenue. It's a very happy sight. It's a happy sight, but it, it's unhappy in another way because we shouldn't be out of Israel. We, we, we have our land. We have our land. We have our country. Life is very difficult in Israel. But if we were together and leave the Galut, Things would change immediately, positively. The Arabs would leave. They would leave, because they'd see, they'd see that uh, there's no place for them. Well, when the Jews came uh, originally, the Arabs came because the Jews were there making things better. Even now, the Palestinians benefit mostly from even the, the settlements until 
until the politics. So if uh, if more Western Jews came there, maybe the, the Arabs would have a greater incentive to stay. You're exactly you're right. If the Western Jew goes there and remains Western, and lives in the cities, in population concentrations, the Arabs will have the land. We have to be on the land. We have to disperse for our own good, for the health of our children. You know, it's almost, in my eyes, it's, it's almost illegal to raise a child in a big city. The air is polluted. You're giving the child weakness. He's growing in weakness. Uh, if the rabbis were wise enough, I think, they just say, you cannot raise a child in Bnei Brak. They have asthma there, the children. It's, it's humid. It's polluted. You should go to the hills. Fifteen minutes away from Bnei Brak, you have Tapua, the mountains. It's a new world. When I go down from Tapua, to tell you, I feel I'm going out of Israel. I really feel it. You're going into the Shefela. Shefela means the lowlands. I feel very low in Tel Aviv. It's very low. It's like America to me. When I go to the mountains, I'm in Israel again. Do you feel like you're in the time of the Bible? Very, very close to it. I cannot be as an individual in the time of... Judaism was not given to individuals, it was given to a people. As long as I'm alone as a shepherd, I'll never feel content. I feel other people have to participate and feel the, what I feel, which is a good thing. Do you feel that you, you live more Jewishly by being on the land? I do. I, I'm connected with, our, with, uh, with Avram Yitzhak Yaakov. We just finished the uh, Sefer Bereshit. It tells that our forefathers were, were shepherds. Not out of lack of alternatives. They wouldn't want to be computer programmers. They wouldn't want to be speculators in the stock market. They wanted to have contact with God's work. They chose this. Not because of lack of uh, alternatives. I always ask rabbis, Shlomo HaMelech was very wise. He could have invented an automobile, an airplane, a telephone. But he knew this would create confusion, chaos, speed. Speed kills, not only because of accidents. The, the, the rapidity of a person's life, when you're running and you're under pressure, you're losing everything. Not only your health, you're losing thoughts. See, I have clear thoughts in the field. That's what I have. Three, four hours of clear thinking. It's worth a great deal. <laughs> Do you feel like you're, uh, you're an extension of, of the Torah in, in your work? I'm living with the Torah, you see. I cannot be in the field without reading Torah. I usually have a small homash in my pocket, except on Shabbat when I can't take it. But uh, if I don't read in the field, I feel, first of all, it gives me a strength against our, our enemies. When I read, I read out loud, and I feel they're afraid. I, and not only I feel, I know it. It's a fact for me. I've been it so many years. Because... Um, it's hard to say this because uh, their cruelty makes, makes us look at them as subhuman. I mean, to kill children, to kill what the way they kill, it's subhuman. Let's not get away from the facts. But still in all, they, they have a sensitivity toward a Jew who's doing what I'm doing. So they keep away from me. Baruch Hashem. A respect, you think? I do believe so. I do believe so. I've spoken to them many times face to face. Yeah. Tell me, does it, does it pain you to deal with Palestinians after what they did to your daughter? Any, any terrorist attack, not only my, my daughter and my son-in-law, the next day when I see Arabs, I look them in the face and I... I mean, I, uh, I can't look at them and they know it. And, uh, well, they move away. They move away. And um, they have the word in Arabic, shahid, shahid, means someone who commits suicide, the Arabs. And they have a reward in the other world, so to speak. It's a d ridiculous concept. They have, a for killing, they can explode themselves in a restaurant. That's what's happened in Jerusalem. It's happened. Families were killed by these subhuman terrorists. And they get a reward. They have streets named after them afterwards, and their families get money. So it's... Do you believe, so, 
Go on. Uh, so if our government believes, and if the American government believes that we can live in peace with them, they are making a terrible mistake, and it's going to be paid for in blood, in their blood, in our blood. But they're going to lose in the end, because the next war, we're not going to leave them around. The last war, we left them. They came back. Next war, they won't be coming back. So I really don't want to kill. I don't want to see blood spilled. I really don't. Let them go. There are so many places for them to live. Make fences in our... It's such... I don't want to say it is a small land. For me, for me, it's endless. When I'm in the field, I feel it's endless. But geographically, I mean, <laughs> you're going to put 10 million people. If, if the President of America thinks he's going to put us in a fenced-in area, he should remember the song that I was taught when I was young. Give me land, lots of land, under starry, sky, starry skies above. Don't fence us in. Don't fence us in, Mr. Obama. You're making a mistake, and it's going to be a terrible mistake when the blood starts to spill. We can't be at peace with these people. Put them at a distance from us. Give them a piece of Texas, maybe. Why can't we be at peace with them? Because they're at our throats. They Why? say it, they're at our throats. They say it very plainly. They want all of Israel, Haifa, Tel Aviv, everything. So they say it very clearly. We're just stupid. We don't absorb the facts. Do you think uh, a land solution, uh, a territorial solution? No, of course which, which not. No, there's no compromise. You can't make compromises. We've lost always when we... What happened in Oslo and all these things? We want to give them, and they actually didn't want to take it. Baruch Hashem. There's no, there's no compromising with what God gave us. If God gives us a present, we're going to say half for our, our enemies. But could, we, could the Arabs, you think, live as part of Israel if, if Israel were to annex the land and keep the No, no, people they can't. There? They can't. They can't. They're educated in hate. They're the Quran. They think that the Temple Mount belongs to them because they put a mosque there. And so it's not a territorial issue? You're saying it's a... It is for us. It's for us. It's our land. We've got to get it through our heads and hearts, that there's no compromises on land. You can't say, you take half, we'll take half, we'll live in peace. There won't be peace. It'll be pieces, but not peace. He's cutting things in pieces. It's very funny that English has this yeah. lack of uh, clarity in language. Peace. He's making peace by cutting us into pieces. There'll be no peace, no shalom. Shalom, shalom can only achieve when each, each nation has its own land. What about annexing Yesha, annexing Judea and Samaria? It has to be done. It has to be done. But can the Arabs live there, you think, as good Israeli citizens? No, maybe, no, maybe they can't. It, they can't. If they were educated in one more generation? No, because they want to control the land, and the land belongs to us. We have to, see, that's the problem with, with us. We're not out on the land, as I said before. If we come as Americans, we want to live in a suburban area and go to the supermarket and not grow something by our own hands, we're never going to come back to the land. We've got to go back to simplicity. We've got to grow our own trees as much as possible. You can't do it in a year. You can't do it in two years. Slowly begin. Use the supermarket, but slowly start to grow some vegetables. My wife does it. I raised 11 children. And we never bought meat outside. We never, most of our vegetables were born. We had our own chickens, our own eggs. We made our own cheese, our own yogurt. I raised all my 11 children. We, my wife never worked a day. Only in the house with the children.